This is the river. The river of endlessly flowing history. The river without which there would be no London. The river of breathless beauty and teeming commerce, both changing and changeless. Kings have sailed on it. Feudal overlords have jousted on its frozen surface. And millions of people have loved it. But how is Britain's most famous waterway measuring up to the demands of today? The Thames begins here, high on the Cotswold Hills above Cirencester, 210 miles from the sea. Water gushes out only after heavy rain, and the riverbed is usually dry for several miles before the stream starts trickling. Here, at Ashton Keynes, the Thames is only 15 feet wide as it flows under the tiny bridges. The Colne is the first of the Cotswold Little Rivers to feed the big one. Many more keep Old Father Thames rolling along. Down river to Lechlade and the first fishing resort on the Thames. The trout here are jovial, like the famous pub known to generations of fishermen. And it's here that we meet the first of the river's 45 locks. Also the first lock keeper. The Thames flows ever onwards with a sure consistency, though some inconsistent things happen on the way such as Newbridge, having one of the oldest bridges anywhere on the river. The Upper Thames is where every prospect pleases. Well, almost. Some riverside glimpses of Oxford seem out of character with the dreaming spires of Britain's oldest university city. Punts are vanishing, but boating is booming. Motor cruisers are the thing now, if you mean to be with it. 500 are hired out every year, apart from the private craft of the lucky ones. And no speeding by order. The limit is eight miles an hour. So far, the Thames is the river of pleasure seekers. Unchanged, except that today there are more seekers than ever. Every year, the tourists come in bigger numbers to see one of the most famous views in the country. And then, from Windsor, sail on to Runnymede, where a bad king signed a good charter. At Kingston, and again at Richmond, there's some of the best boating and fishing on the river. It's still nearly 70 miles to the open sea, and from Teddington, where the tide ends, you sail under 28 bridges before you reach the tower. Incidentally, a whale swam 60 miles upriver and died when it fractured its skull diving into shallow water near Kew. Even now, with London only just around the corner, the river still clings to the last of its rural charm. And at Hammersmith, there's still an air of a more leisured age. But thereafter, the great change begins. London takes over the river with its giant power stations, its sprawl of docks, quays, wharves and shipping, and the sewage from the world's greatest city, which has polluted the river so much that for miles downstream from Chelsea, no fish can live. But pollution isn't the only headache. There are bigger issues, and the biggest is can London cope with increasing trade in ever bigger ships? For two years, experts investigating the nation's major ports with a spotlight on London have held nearly 50 meetings and have come up with recommendations which have caused some heartburnings. Today, one of the problems is lost traffic in a port which handles one-third of all Britain's imports and exports. Out of the pool with its barges and lighters. 
The biggest lightweight company on the river owns more than 600 of these craft. Into the docks with their big ships and a big deal in cars going out to the world. Next door, Sunday's joint is coming in. Despite setbacks, the signs point to a new surge in foreign trade. Can the river, with its present port set up, handle it? We've moved into the heyday of the super tanker, the mighty bulk cargo carrier. In passing, all this will go up in smoke. It's tobacco. Britain still imports about 100 million pounds worth a year. The experts talk of a growing sense of dissatisfaction with many of the port services. London, say the men who know, must forge ahead with physical development. The new and bigger ships need deeper water and the last word in discharging gear. It all adds up to a radical reassessment of port facilities. A boatman makes his way up whopping old stairs for a quick one in the 500 years old town of Ramsgate Inn, where pirates drank their last tot before being rowed downriver to be hanged in chains at execution dock. It was in this bar that the infamous Judge Jeffreys was caught when he nipped in for a quick one while trying to flee the country back in 1688. Today's customers are hard-working men whose future is the future of the river itself. Docks like this range over 4,000 acres with nearly 36 miles of keys. About a third of the entire docks were wiped out during the war, and money has since been poured in like a Thames tide. 40 million pounds have gone on rebuilding, and by 1968, 30 million more will have been spent. Down river, past Greenwich, out in the estuary, there's a new scientific device which predicts the tides more accurately and so helps the new giants of shipping to get right alongside the wharves. But physical development isn't the only factor. Some blame dock strikes for lost tonnage, but the unions say their demands are just. They've won a 40-hour week but many feel that unrest comes from the casual nature of the docker's job, and work on a regular basis is being discussed. Modernization of London's great port goes on, but the jackpot question is, can the river do it in time to meet the mounting challenge of a new mercantile age?